I'd like to start by thanking uh, the library for this opportunity to talk to my Department of Commerce colleagues. Um, it's, it's in the spirit of this uh, symposium, I would, um, I'm, I'm, I developed my presentation to be mostly um, educational. So what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today is flexible electronics in a manner that I hope is accessible um, to try to tell you sort of what's happening in flexible electronics right now. Um, and I'll give you some examples um, throughout the presentation of NIST work uh, that we're doing to, um, to try to accelerate the development of flexible electronics. So um, as you know, I'm from NIST. And I think my Department of Commerce colleagues are fairly familiar with NIST. Uh, NIST has a mission to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science standards and technology. And uh, we view flexible electronics at NIST as sort of an emerging technology, something that may enable um, the growth of new industry in the, in the United States. Um, the flexible electronics uh, project within NIST is located mostly in our Gaithersburg campus, um, which is not too far from here, about a 45 minute uh, metro ride. Um, the large facility infrastructure that NIST has, particularly its uh, synchrotron um, uh, capabilities are something I'm gonna be talking about today in my talk. So onto the main show, flexible electronics. Um, it's, a t it's a phrase that's used a lot um, it means a fairly broad swath of technologies, uh, but usually the common factor is it's the production of electronic components on a flexible substrate. The substrate is something that you put the electronics on. So usually it's plastic, but maybe it could be a woven fabric too, maybe even metal foil. A very wide array of products are envisioned. I'm showing you many examples here uh, from a variety of companies, large and small, that are attempting to make flexible electronics products, uh, either memory, sensors, um, power storage, very thin lithium batteries, um, solid state lighting, uh, wearables, solar power, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's safe to say that flexible electronics technology is currently breaking through through the consumer marketplace, um, especially in the last couple years. Um, we see new products introduced um, and we've seen this technology really starting to take off. So um, I'm gonna show you some examples in the presentation of, of where we've seen that happen very recently. So why are people so excited about flexible electronics? Well, its key advantage is manufacturing cost. And I'm being a little unfair here, uh, but I'd like to compare the cost of a modern Intel fab circa 2014, 2015 at more than $3 billion for a single fabrication facility um, to a flexible electronics fab, um, which you could actually make in your garage um, for probably somewhat less than $3 million. Now, these two facilities are not going to produce the same electronics. Um, but what I'm trying to show you is that flexible electronics is kind of a new mode of manufacturing um, with a significantly lower entry cost um, that may enable product innovation. Um, and this has definitely caught the attention of industry and uh, the FlexTech Alliance, which is a consortium, um, I borrowed this slide from them. Um, they put the market opportunity today at a, around $10 billion, um, but that could actually significantly increase depending on the types of products um, that become enabled. And the way they think about it, and here we see the phrase printed electronics instead of flexible electronics, basically the same thing. Um, embedding simple intelligence with cost efficient manufacturing techniques. So again, you see this emphasis on low cost. Notice nobody's promising um, the very best in the uh, processing power. This is never going to compete with Pentium chips. Um, in fact, for, for many people, this flexible printed electronics uh, technology seems like uh, maybe a nice technology for Internet of Things. Uh, that is, low-cost, ubiquitous electronics devices that maybe don't have a lot of processing power, but maybe don't require a lot of energy either. Um, and that but might be embedded in almost anything. And so here I'm showing you um, a cute little example of a milk carton. 
Um, and imagine if when we're making that milk carton and we're printing the graphics and the text, we could also print some electronics. We could print a simple power supply. Um, we could print a simple sensor that might be able to tell you the temperature of what's inside. Um, a simple processor and RFID communication. It doesn't need to do complex calculations. It just has to communicate what's going on inside the container. Um, what if we could do that by adding only a couple of cents to the cost of the, the printing process? That's the kind of vision that drives printed flexible electronics. So the idea here is that we would borrow tools, fabrication tools, from graphic arts. And by, by that I mean anything that's used to, use, to make printed or graphic media um, to actually fabricate electronic devices, circuits, displays, solar, etc. cetera. Um, in addition, because you're usually printing on something that's flexible, you get this flexible form factor. And this gives you some, a, a significant latitude for product innovation. People can make different kinds of devices, and I'll show you some of these later, on a flexible substrate compared to a hard substrate. Um, in a way, it kind of complements the maker uh, revolution that's currently going on, because with printing, you could have bespoke functionality. You could design a circuit, print it, test it. If you don't like it, change it, print it again. Um, and, and that leads to a sort of rapid prototyping. So again, one thing I want to emphasize here, nobody in flexible electronics is suggesting that it's just going to replace our Intel i7 processors. Um, this is going to be new products and new materials from new methods of production. It's a new manufacturing technique. So just to start into some of the specifics, how would we print electronics? Well. I think most of us are familiar with inkjet printers. Um, inkjet printers work with either a simple uh, piezo or a simple um, thermal a process, which expels a little droplet of solution. Um, and when I say simple, it's not simple at all. Um, in fact, we have a group at NIST that focuses exclusively on the physics of droplet deposition by inkjet because it is a really complex process. Um, but the idea here is that if your ink can dry to make conductors, dielectrics, semiconductors, you could use inkjet printing to make circuits. Um, and this is something that you would like, for example, if you were doing a maker style project where you want to be able to change it rapidly because the inkjet can make almost anything you like. All you have to do is change the software and you can print something different. It is, however, slow. It's what we call a, a, a serial process. The inkjet can only do one drop at a time um, and it draws over the surface. And so that's one reason it's difficult to make an inkjet printer extremely large. And I'm showing you here some examples um, in industry of different kinds of inkjet printers that one might use for printed electronics. So these are special. They are better printers than you would ever print graphics on because they can print smaller. Um, even this uh, small Dymatics printer here um, can print with about 10 micron resolution, which is smaller than your eye can discriminate. So it can print simple conducting lines, semiconducting lines. Um, and then this can be scaled up to a larger size, like this Litrex printer here. But if you wanted to make a lot of flexible electronics very rapidly, you're probably going to have to go back to what is essentially the cousin of the newspaper press. Um, which is a, what is called R2R or roll-to-roll -roll style deposition using something like slot dye or gravure printing. Um, and slot dye is um, kind of exactly what it sounds. There is a dye, which is a, essentially a metal enclosure um, with a hollow center through which ink is forced. Um, and it's basically smeared onto a moving substrate. That's it. Um, again, it sounds simple, and the physics of it are quite complex. Um, if you use something like Gravure, the coding physics are a little different, um, but by having a pattern on this roller, you're able to produce pattern circuitry. Uh, now, this is not something where you're going to do rapid iteration. You're going to have to have this, manu this roller manufactured with a pattern on it, 
And so this is something you only use once you know exactly what you want to make, uh, because it can be very expensive to retool your, uh, your gravure roller. This is an incredibly fast, high volume kind of coding process. Um, with simple unpatterned slot dye, this is something you'd probably want for solid state lighting or photovoltaics. Um, for, for gravure, something like high volume circuit patterning. And basically, you can scale this up enormously. Um, in fact, you know, a, a printing press is a good way to think about it. And uh, it's essentially you know, how much you're willing to spend is how big you can go. Um, more recently, in fact, this is a video I, I took from uh, Voxel 8 on their YouTube. Um, we see the maker community actively exploring printed electronics. Um, and uh, these images and uh, uh, this movie are from Voxel 8. And what they're doing is they're depositing a conductive ink uh, using a syringe style 3D printer. Um, and they're doing this in what appears to be an integrated fashion with a traditional 3D printer. Um, to make this, of course it's a drone, um, to make this simple toy drone uh, that has essentially embedded conducting lines within the plastic. Um, and it's, it's, it's some, actually something interesting that would be hard to do with traditional plastic molding techniques like injection molding, but turns out to be pretty easy to do. Well, I don't want to say easy again, but it turns out to be straightforward. Um, in these videos at least, for this company to achieve um, using this modified 3D printing process. Um, I don't want to claim I know anything about uh, Voxel 8's ink or their ink deposition process, but to my eye, it looks like the drying process here is somewhere between inkjet and slot dye. Um, the material is being deposited probably more like slot dye than inkjet. These are not discrete droplets, it's continuous flow. So onto materials, what would we put flexible electronics on? Well, obviously plastic is a good candidate. Um, and probably the most commonly described substrate for flexible electronics is polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, which is the same plastic that Coke bottles are made out of. Now, um, PET is nice and transparent. Um, it turns out to be, in its normal form, a little too rough for electronics. Um, and often you have to buy special flat PET. What you're seeing here is a special kind of flat PET made by DuPont Tajin Films. Um, sometimes too, the plastic is not uh, heat tolerant enough to be used in electronics processing because when you print these, sometimes you have to anneal them or put them through a furnace. And so different other plastics are sometimes used like polyimids, or a polyethylene um, uh, napthalene uh, PEN, a version of PET that is more thermally stable. Um, it would be lovely to be able to print electronics on stretchable elastomers, some like this DuPont elastomer you're seeing here. Um, the elastomer can stretch a lot. The interesting question is whether all that conducting stuff that you printed on it can also stretch. Um, and I'll get into the mechanical properties of some of these printed materials a little later. Um, but that's, that's an interesting big question mark is how stretchable could you make flexible electronics for really novel or innovative wearables? Um, getting back to a little bit more conventional substrates, uh, thin strong glass, what you're seeing here is corning willow glass, um, which can actually be bent around a pencil without breaking. Um, is actually a very nice candidate for flexible electronics. Um, it's hard to match the oxygen and water barrier properties of glass. Um, so an issue with a lot of printed uh, electronic materials is that they tend to be air and water sensitive. But if you can encapsulate them in glass, um, it's, a, it's a much better barrier than the plastic. And then finally, good old architectural glass. This may not be obvious, um, but a very nice substrate that you could put a lot of electronics on and add a lot of value to is windows. They're everywhere. Um, and imagine if they could display information, do processing for you, or harvest solar power at the same time as being windows. Moving on with materials, um, if you're going to make electronics, you have to have conductors. And probably the most common kind of conductor that you're going to see in printed electronics 
is uh, metal particle inks. So these are dispersions typically of nanoparticles, uh, sometimes uh, spherical, sometimes wire shaped. They come in different shapes and sizes. Um, in a solution that when deposited will form essentially a metal residue that will conduct electricity. Um, this uh, clear O material here on the right is especially significant. This is uh, made by a startup company called Cambrios on the west coast. Um, especially significant because it can make conformal films that are relatively transparent. And so this is great, getting back to our window application, you know, if you print a bunch of electronics on it, you might still want to be able to see through it. Um, and this is a, a material where you can get relatively high conductivities um, and uh, is relatively clear. Um, when you get to uh, different kinds of conductors, and it's sort of an emerging style of conductor that's becoming more, more prominent are carbon allotropes. So this is either graphene, which you've probably heard a lot about. It's the new flavor of the month, magic material. Um, or carbon nanotubes, which were last decade's flavor of the month, ma uh, magic material. Uh, both of these materials have, um, in many cases, excellent conduction properties. Um, the material they're made from carbon is enormously abundant. Um, and the difficulty here is typically in producing it in the form that you want, particularly with carbon nanotubes, um, getting the conducting tubes and separating out uh, other kinds of tubes. Now, where the rubber meets the road, the hardest part of printed electronics um, is the semiconductor. And it's so hard to make good printed semiconductors um, that in the near term, most of the industry is turning toward low-cost integrated circuits as a solution for logic. Um, and the reason, part of the reason is it's, these kinds of ICs can be made tremendously cheaply these days. Um, and the idea is that you would have your flexible plastic substrate, you'd be printing your conductors, um, and you would simply use pick and place a, a robot to put chips onto it. Now, the chips that you're putting aren't flexible, so you might lose a bit of your flexible form factor. Um, and in the end, this is probably not going to scale the production cost down as much as you would want for the full realization of, uh, of your printed flexible electronics. And so in the far term, um, what a lot of people are focused on is the idea of high performance or at least uh, adequate performance printable semiconductors. Um, and there are many families of these. Uh, here's carbon nanotubes again. If you separate them the right way, the carbon nanotubes can actually be a semiconductor. Um, 2D materials, which are like graphene, but are typically inorganic. Uh, mol mol molybdenum disulfide is a good example. Um, they are plate-like materials that can act as semiconductors. Um, but probably the biggest family, and the one that's seen an enormous amount of attention um, in terms of the fundamental science, are the organic semiconductors. And that's what I'm going to focus on for um, mostly for the remainder of my talk is these organic semiconductors and how they can be turned into an adequate printable semiconductor to support flexible electronics. So it's going to get a little sciency for a second. Um, how can molecules act as semiconductors? Um, and the answer is probably a, a phrase that you've heard a lot, and that is a free radical. Um, the basic idea here is that if you have an organic molecule with lots of alternating single and double bonds, um, it becomes relatively straightforward to either take away or add an electron to it. And when you do that, you create a charge carrying state. And so here I'm removing an electron from this molecule, which has lots of alternating single and double bonds. And now I have this moving charge, which is a positive um, polaron, which can carry charge along the molecule. So um, that's a relatively simplified version of it. There are a lot more details when I'm showing you down here. But what I want to point out is, is that if you remember from freshman chemistry, this concept of aromatic resonance, where this uh, 
you have this benzene molecule and you can draw the double bonds either this way or this way and it's the same. Um, that's basically the same concept whereby this polarine is able to move along the molecule um, by, by moving um, through the pi cloud that is delocalized over the molecule. Now, in printable semiconductor, you're not just going to have one molecule, you're going to have a bunch. And, and I feel it's important to emphasize why organics are so different than inorganics. So in an inorganic semiconductor like silicon, it's a covalent crystal. That means there are bonds between all the atoms. Um, it has extremely high mobility of the charge carriers. And the way you process silicon is by first making a perfect crystal and then cutting it. In contrast, in organics, there are gaps between these molecules. So it's what we call a van der Waals crystal. So any charge has to hop from molecule to molecule. That's a key difference. The mobility tends to be lower because of that hopping and also because the dielectric constant is lower. Um, and most importantly, and this gets back to the difficulty in making printed semiconductors, the structure that you get, this crystal structure here, forms dynamically as the ink dries. So instead of like silicon where we first can make a perfect crystal and then cut it how we want it, here we print it and hope that it forms the perfect crystal structure to get the kind of performance that we want. Um, and it often doesn't. And this is one of the key reasons that printable semiconductors has been so challenging in the flexible electronics community. It all depends on how the ink dries. You know, back in the graphic arts printing days, it just has to look good. Now we need it to actually do something and sometimes do it well in order to make a functional printed device. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk. I'm going to discuss three key organic electronic devices: um, organic thin film transistors, OLEDs, and OPV. So in the transistors, um, I'm just giving you a very brief tutorial on how these things work. Um, basically, you have a channel that extends between the source and the drain, labeled electrodes. We put a voltage on the gate, and that creates charges in the channel, which allow you to move current between the source and the drain. You'll notice that there isn't a lot of current flow through the gate, but there's a lot between the source and the drain. So essentially, this thing acts as a switch. As you put more voltage on the gate, you get more current through the source and the drain. Um, here's an example of a typical OTFT solution. Um, they come in all sorts of colors. Um, the ones that are red, orange, and purple tend to work the best. Don't ask me why. Um, here's an example of a new product that has very recently been announced that's based on OTFT. That's Polyera's Wove Band, which was announced earlier this month. Um, it's based on an organic TFT backplane. So behind each pixel is one of those transistors that I just showed you acting as a switch. To, uh, to turn the pixel on and off. Um, it uses what's called an e-ink display, which is not an emissive display. Um, it's, a, it's a display that holds a reflective color. It's, it was used for a lot of the early Kindles. Um, and you can see here, um, Polyera is really taking advantage of the flexible form factor to try to introduce a wearable that is really distinct from current, other current kinds of smartwatches on the market. Um, so uh, they're really emphasizing this sort of flexible nature of the backplane and its ability to attach to a flexible substrate and make a flexible consumer product. Um, this video um, was uh, provided by Android Authority and this, this uh, device actually runs on a variation of the Android operating system. So getting back to the kind of things we do at NIST, to try to help the uh, development of organic thin film transistors. Again, as I said, you're not working with a single molecule. Um, 
so I'm showing you pentacene as example. You see the alternating single and double bonds. Um, that's a prerequisite for the organic semiconductor. It's going to crystallize in some fashion um, via intermolecular interactions form a thin film. Then we're gonna put that thin film or that thin film is gonna be printed onto a device and then you're going to actually, the transistor action is going to occur in a very thin layer next to the gate dielectric. Um, so in order to measure the structure, you need to know what the structure is in that thin layer. So an example of NIST work in OTFT um, was to discover the packing structure, the crystal engineering um, for a material that was discovered several years ago. Um, it was made by Merck. They kind of serendipitously discovered that this material had really excellent charge transport. Um, and by applying a variety of uh, measurement methods, which are mostly described by acronyms here, and I can go into more detail on this in Q&A if you're extremely interested. Um, at NIST, we were able to determine the precise packing structure of this, and it, it's really um, a special kind of crystal. Um, the parts that uh, transport charge are arranged in galleries that are tightly knit together by these insulating uh, interlocking side chains. Um, and we were really proud of this achievement and being able to measure the structure. Um, and more importantly, you know, our, our work and the work of others at this time suggested that this was the way to make really high performance semiconductors was crystal engineering to get extremely uh, high quality rigid crystals, um, kind of like organic, like inorganic semiconductors um, to try to get better performance. But, but we were wrong. Um, and some of our work in mechanical properties, um, I'll draw your attention mostly to the, down here, this brittle fracture. Um, what we found by using a buckling and bending based metrology is that these extremely nice crystal structures were really brittle. In fact, they were about as brittle as their inorganic counterparts. So at 2% strain, these things fractured, cracked all over the place. And, and so there goes the idea of using them on a flexible substrate, and in fact, they probably wouldn't even be good for a bendable substrate. And so at the end of the day, this idea of engineering hard, robust, large crystals may not be the best way. Um, and in fact, as we've seen the evolution of performance, um, here's the hard crystallizing one, um, and a variety of more complex chemical structures here. Um, you don't need to memorize these, by the way. Um, what we've seen is that an emergence of extremely low levels of structure, so forget crystal engineering, um, while maintaining or even improving the mobility, the high performance. And so this is pretty, pretty exciting, and it's only come out in the last couple years that there exist materials like this with very low levels of long range order that have extremely high performance. And the reason this is interesting is they're probably still very flexible, maybe even stretchable, but high performance. In fact, uh, most recently, here's an example of a material um, that has an extremely high mobility comparable to amorphous silicon, um, but is essentially amorphous, with no diffraction features. And uh, the reason this can still work is if we go down to the molecular picture, this yellow highlighted molecular contour, the molecule itself is very ordered, even though the overall material isn't. And that, at the end of the day, may be the reason that this performs well. And once we learn this, we kind of look back at the things we had done with the crystal engineering, and we realized that maybe that was the reason that worked too, because the crystal, packing in the crystal makes the molecule itself nice and rigid. So maybe good crystal engineering is one way to get at a nice rigid molecular contour, but there seem to be others. And so now we're seeing, and we hope to see, an explosion of materials that have this very high level of molecular order, but are lacking this long range order, still maintaining high performance. Okay, moving on in terms of application. Um, this is one you may have heard a good bit about, organic light emitting diodes. Um, the way these things work is a little different than the transistor. Um, basically, you inject charges 
electrons and holes from either side of the device. They meet in the middle, hopefully in the emissive layer, and uh, they create an excited state that decays by emitting a photon, and that's how the light comes out. Different emissive layers give you different colors. You want red, green, and blue if you want to make a device. Um, here's an example of OLED emitters. They tend to be extremely brightly colored. Um, by the way, real OLED device stacks are actually significantly more complex than what I'm showing you here. This is sort of the bare minimum in terms of getting good OLED performance. Um, they may have more than 20 layers in real commercial OLED. And you've probably heard of OLED because it's in commercial TVs. And in fact, it's in smartphones. Um, it's an organic electronics technology where the electronic properties are really good for the intended application for, for emitting light in displays. Um, and here is an example of an LG TV um, that is extremely thin. Um, it's one to two millimeters thin, about the same thickness as a credit card. And this is commercially available now. Um, I want to point out that most of the thickness of this TV that you're seeing here is actually to protect it from damage. Uh, the actual emissive layers are much, much thinner. Um, and this, this is a common theme in printed electronics is you, this encapsulation, protection from water uh, and air, et cetera, um, actually bulks up your device significantly. So it goes on, but mostly they're just bending it in different ways. So I told you all about how organic, uh, how printed electronics, flexible electronics is all about ubiquitous, low cost manufacturing. And those of you who looked into OLED TVs know they're extraordinarily expensive, right? Why? Well, they're not made using flexible electronics approaches right now. They're made using traditional semiconductor uh, fabrication approaches because it's much more controllable. And so they use vacuum deposition to make these, uh, to make these displays because they can control the thickness and uniformity of all those layers. And so they pump down uh, these, these uh, cluster tools to near space pressures, really, really low pressures. Um, and then they evaporate all these different layers onto them. And it, that's why it's so expensive, because the vacuum chamber cost scales exponentially with the size of the vacuum chamber. And the trend in the display industry is to keep on making these things bigger and bigger. In fact, for, uh, for this is a single sheet of Gen 10 glass which can be made into six 65-inch displays. Um, and so this is the issue with OLED right now. But what we'd like to see is an OLED technology based on flexible electronics approaches, um, like solution process OLED. Um, there's not a lot about this on the web right now because there are probably, probably a lot of stealth efforts going on. Um, particularly in Japan, Korea, uh, to develop OLED printers. So here's an example of an early OLED printer that looks like it's accepting Gen 9 glass. Um, and uh, it's much harder to print OLEDs than it is to thermally evaporate them. Um, you have to get the thickness exactly right. You need to be able to print very thin, uniform layers, layer interactions. So that may be one of the key difficulties. And uh, to illustrate this, imagine, you know, so I said there may be up to 20 layers, right? So imagine printing, and as you print, the subsequent layers are delivered in a solvent that may dissolve the layers you already printed. And so there's a very high probability of disrupting or modifying what you already put down. There are a lot of approaches to this. Uh, perhaps you could cure or fix or cross-link the material that you put down so that it no longer soluble when you do subsequent printing steps, but that adds steps to your production. A different way would be to use what are called orthogonal solvents, solvents that um, uh, do not dissolve the layers underneath. That, but trying to find 20 different completely orthogonal solvents is essentially impossible. There aren't that many kinds of chemicals or liquids on Earth. And so there are a lot of challenges. But imagine the payoff. So imagine OLED displays, TVs, being produced essentially by newspaper presses. It would cause the cost of OLED displays to plummet. And it would change how we think about display surfaces. It would essentially permit you to make 
wallpaper light displays that were nearly ubiquitous or you know window laminates you know why not have a window that displays information too if it costs almost the same um, you know and I think I personally think this is right around the corner 10 20 years out perhaps um, but we will see in our lifetimes probably um, solution process OLED displays at extraordinarily low cost so an example of uh, NIST work in OLED, um, our partner Solve OLED was developing a printable electron blocking layer using one of these strategies I told you about before to try to keep it from redissolving. And what they found is that by modifying the chemistry, there's a lot of ways you can modify the chemistry, um, they could greatly increase the device lifetime or efficiency by changing the, uh, the electron blocking layer. And uh, we used spectroscopic and depth profiling techniques to try to examine the characteristics of the interface to determine how that they were affecting device lifetime and efficiency. Um, I can't go into more details here, but uh, this is an example of the kind of issues that are facing solution printed OLED. Um, next is organic photovoltaics. This is basically the opposite of OLED. What we're doing is we're absorbing light and we're creating the whole electron. Um, it's a lot harder to do that than it is to emit light in organics. And in fact, uh, in order to get it to work, you have to have two different materials um, in a distributed interface. I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, but basically, the photons are absorbed, you create an excited state, which then splits into a whole electron and is harvested by the device. Here's an example of a typical OPV solution. And uh, right away, you'll notice it's not as colorful as the OLED ones, and that's on purpose, because exactly what you want for photovoltaics is something that's as black as possible, that absorbs as much of the solar spectrum as you can get. So lots of new products out there from organic photovoltaics. Most of these are new product concepts, taking advantage of either the highly colored nature of OPV, um, the fact that you can change the color um, or the flexible form factor. Um, a lot of places or research institutes around the world are looking into organic photovoltaics. Um, the umbrella, I think, is especially cute. Um, or, you know, uh, small chargers for, uh, for example, for personal handheld electronics um, that might work in, in any environment that has, that has ambient light. Now, I mentioned architectural glass earlier, and um, building integrated PV is definitely a niche that people are looking at for, for PV. Um, first off, there's a bunch of, all of these are organic semiconductors, all of these colors, uh, and all of them have some kind of solar efficiency. Um, so you have a lot of options when you're, when you're designing with OPV. Um, furthermore, the flexible form factor and the lightweight mean it's relatively easy to make modules that can be integrated on current architectural glass. So what you're seeing here is a Mitsubishi chemical OPV test facility. They have some of the highest OPV efficiencies in the world. Um, and what you're seeing here are these darker windows have OPV modules on them. Um, and what they're looking at, um, you know, walking around DC, um, during the summertime, you catch a lot of glare off the windows, right? The windows are glazed to be reflective, so light doesn't go in and heat up the offices too much. But imagine instead of reflecting that light, you can instead absorb it by putting simple, you know, flexible panels on it. Then you get the glare reduction, you don't get the, uh, the light into the uh, office, and you're harvesting electricity at the same time. That's the kind of thing they're thinking about with these kind of building integrated PV. Uh, PV, OPV works pretty well in low light conditions too, like this room for example. Um, so this is another early niche. Um, and this is mostly because the active layer is an organic material. Um, and with a lower index of refraction, it accepts light better even from lower angles. Um, and so if the light is coming at it obliquely, it tends to perform better than an inorganic material. Um, a little bit of science, again, so please indulge me. Um, the organic heterojunction I mentioned earlier um, has a more complex operation um, than an OLED. Um, and so it can kind of be broken into steps. The first step, obviously, is absorption, 
where we absorb the incident light. That creates an excited state called an exciton. In organics, the exciton has to diffuse to an interface with a potential offset to split. Now in inorganics, usually the exciton splits automatically at thermal energy. So there's a big difference here between organic and inorganic photovoltaics. Um, the interface has to kind of be within three to 10 nanometers of the site of absorption or you lose the exciton. Um, and then once it's split, you then have to carry the whole and electron to their respective electrodes. Now, a, a, a key uh, conflict here is that the film needs to be about 100 nanometers thick and to, in order to absorb a healthy amount of light. But the interface has to be within three to 10 nanometers of where you absorbed it. And so what this means is there has to be interface everywhere in the film in order for this to work. And so that's where this bulk header junction idea came from. And the basic idea here is that you would take your two materials, um, dissolve them in the same solution and cast them and hope that you get this finely divided ramified structure um, where interface is everywhere. You know, maybe the domains are only 10 nanometers wide. You still have 100 to 200 nanometers of film thickness. You can absorb a lot of light. Um, and then hopefully there are actually ways that all the charge can get out of that thing. Um, it's kind of amazing that this works as well as it does, to be honest, um, because it's usually done without a lot of um, control or forethought. Um, and as you might expect, it's kind of become an object of fascination um, in the research community about how might we manipulate the structure um, using you know, complex uh, molecular approaches like block copolymers or supermolecular chemistry, ways to tailor uh, organic material on the nanoscale. There have been a lot of attempts at this. Um, sadly, most of them, in fact, all of them, besides simple blending, tend to fail. Um, and simple blending still works the best. Um, and a large part of our, uh, our research program in NIST has been just to determine the structure that is there as opposed to you know, how to control the structure because you know, we kind of want to know what we're starting with with the simple blending. And so an example of NIST work in OPV I'm showing you here is an advanced electron microscopy technique which uh, distinguishes structure in the active layer. The uh, red stuff is the polymer, and the blue stuff is the fullerene from the, uh, the picture I showed you previously. This entire image is only one micron wide. Um, it's a full tomogram, so we have three-dimensional uh, image capability. And uh, we can see where everything is. And using this technique, we're kind of able to tell how the structure forms. Um, so on the left, you have an image that is detected by what's called dark field microscopy, which detects only crystals. And on the right, you have an image extracted from the tomogram I showed you on the previous slide. And what I want to draw your attention to is that these fibrils are essentially the same structural unit that you have in the overall composition. The conclusion here is that the crystallization of component one, that's the polymer, is what's driving the structure formation. Good old fashioned crystallization. It's nothing special. It's not any of those fancy nanostructure you know, control techniques. Just so happens that for a wide variety of organic semiconductors, they tend to make crystals that are just the right length scale for this to work again. It's amazing that this works at all. And only because of that serendipity has it worked with these materials. So very proud of this achievement. What we're currently struggling with is uh, the realization that even if though we can see these compositional connections, they don't necessarily describe the transport pathways. And so, you know, we have kind of blurry white and dark regions here representing different compositions. Um, and we might assume that those compositional connections describe transport pathways. But what we're as a community realizing is that there are a lot of mixed regions in between these domains. Um, and a lot of the charge transport may be happening in a way that's kind of invisible to us in these mixed regions or interfaces between regions. Um, and not along what appear to be super highways for charge transport and really aren't. So I'm gonna change gears a little bit and for the last part of my talk, um, talk a little bit about how um, government and industry are turning to manufacturing. And so um, first off, I wanna thank Eric Forsyth at ARL for this slide. Um, our, uh, the uh, government, the Department of Defense, 
just in August, established a new flexible electronics manufacturing innovation institute. Uh, this has $75 million in federal funding and an equal or larger amount of matching funds from industry. Um, it is, has, definitely has a DOD style flavor, um, as you can see from some of the graphics. Uh, but it is intended to bootstrap um, flexible electronics to get it over sort of the valley of death um, and into a viable uh, manufacturing marketplace here in the United States. And um, the winner of the uh, competition for this was FlexTech Alliance, an industrial consortium that's focused on flexible electronics. Um, and I want to thank them for this slide, which describes their demo project. Um, in, a, in a way that hopefully will help you convey sort of some of the excitement around flexible electronics. Um, because flexible electronics has this flexible form factor, it's actually a favorite technology for the human machine interface. Um, and what they're focusing on here in this demo project is an idea of essentially a bandage or sweat sensor that can be applied to the human body directly um, that contains sensor pack and communication capability to communicate with a handheld device. Um, and this is for performance monitoring and health monitoring in the field for the soldier. And uh, there are more complex versions of this that are imagined, but this is sort of a proof of concept that they're hoping to scale up. Notice that they want to include both roll-to-roll -roll and pick in place. This is putting the integrated circuits on it. And eventually, we hope that we'll see devices like this that will use printable semiconductors. But for the near term, we're going to see pick and place silicon. Now, at NIST, we're focused on manufacturing, too, to try to help flexible electronics become a mature community. And, and as I tried to emphasize, there are a lot of variables in high-speed commercial production, particularly formulation, drying, um, multiple material interactions, which I've emphasized. Um, and so we try to develop at NIST process measurements that may accelerate this development cycle so that it's easier to go sort of from lab to fab um, and be able to develop and control processes in the fab environment. Now, a lot of what we focus on is slot dye. And in order to do slot dye well, we use a technique called blade coating. Um, which follows the physics of flat dye solution application. So basically, it just involves wiping a solution across the substrate with a hard edge. This is sometimes called knife over edge coating. Um, and we have a custom built NIST blade coater and um, a, a couple commercial available units as well. So um, I wanted to show you this slide because I'm, we're going to use this technique in a bit. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about ink. So um, as I've been emphasizing, what we want in flexible electronics are ways to print conductors and semiconductors, et cetera, in order to make uh, materials that perform well. And the way this has been done for a long time in flexible electronics is simply to dissolve the material in a single solvent and then cast it. Because you don't want to put anything else in there that might influence the semiconducting properties. Um, but when we think about graphic arts ink, it's the exact opposite. They're complex formulations. Even simple ballpoint pen ink has dozens of ingredients. Some of the ingredients in the ink have ingredients lists themselves. Um, it's been developed over centuries. Um, and this is just an example of all the different kinds of additive and formulation approaches that go into making ink, something that we take for granted. So if we imagine a future printed electronics technology, we may have to have the same level of sophistication in our functional inks, where we have all sorts of different additive systems that are tweaking the way the material solidifies to get the kind of performance that we want out of the printed electronic product. And so at NIST, we, we do in situ measurements, essentially watching paint dry, if you will, of, of, of this is this, in this case, this is the blade coating process of an organic photovoltaic. Um, and by using this, this technique, which is uh, called spectroscopic ellipsometry, we can follow the fluid film thickness um, and we can identify points at which the solidification of the material begins and ends. And what we're evaluating here is the influence of a single additive. In it. So we're, we're 
baby steps. We're starting with a single additive in our solution, which is a different liquid than the primary solvent. Um, and just to, to spoil the ending, the additive changes the solidification completely. Um, and it changes particularly the sequence in which the two materials solidify. And so we can do this either with optical techniques or we can actually take this to the synchrotron. Um, and here you see the, uh, basically the same idea, in situ blade coating. Um, in a synchrotron beam with the X-ray beam on, um, if we can follow the fluid film thickness with an interferometer, um, and we can capture the crystallization of the material. And in organic photovoltaics, that's what's driving structure formation, um, as I showed you earlier. Um, this is, requires a fairly automated system to do the data. Um, let me see if I can play this. I can't get it to play. Um, the, uh, the, the diffraction pattern that forms sort of evolves as the material dries, um, and with about 100 millisecond resolution, we can capture where the solidification of the crystallization begins and ends. And our goal here, um, and I don't expect you to, to, um, to focus on the details here, but just it allows us to draw a cartoon, a conceptual cartoon, of exactly how this material solidifies. Um, and uh, what we see is that originally we have one solution. The primary solvent dries off, resulting in the crystallization, um, and the additive forms a separate solution that contains, uh, in this case, the fullerene material. And by removing the fullerene from the primary solution, it actually lets you crystallize more. And so then the additive dries off, and you end up with the final morphology. And so there's a very, what I want to convey to you is that there's a very complex solidification mechanism in the single ink with a single additive. And what we're developing are methods, measurement methods, in order to follow those solidification mechanisms. And we hope to convey those approaches and information to industry to help them de better, develop better materials, better formulations, better processes. Um, and eventually, hopefully, some of the optical versions of these could be used for process control to keep a high quality you know, material being coded um, in an inline manner. Um, at, Inc., we have a, at, at NIST, we have a roll to roll unit um, which is designed precisely for this. Um, it, is, uh, it allows us to do inline measurements of the wet film. Um, this is with a slot die coating, although we hope to adapt it to a gravure later. Um, and uh, many materials, not just OPV, but a wide variety of materials that might be coated conformally. Um, again, the in situ uh, measurement, and I'm showing you here, you know, cartoon optical tools that we would use. So we actually have a variety of these that have already been designed. Um, and then along a long linear heater, we have an instrument package that should be able to measure the structure of the film during early or late drying. Um, and the idea here is, again, this is not a high throughput manufacturing tool. This is a process development station um, in order to understand better ink drying physics um, and the physical mechanisms that underlie um, the solidification of your functional material. And so here's an example of it in action, picture of it where we have a camera that's following the coding process. Um, and a fiber optics that are managing a beam that's going through the wet film. And from that, we're uh, collecting optical information about structure that's forming at this point in the drying process. This is my final slide. Um, just to emphasize our future plans, you've probably seen from my presentation where we think we're going with this. Um, but the basic idea is to combine um, some of these optical methods with some of these uh, sexy or synchrotron methods um, to create transferable metrology. So um, low cost optical methods um, that can be adopted by industry for their own process design or process control. Um, and with that, hopefully we'll be able to help accelerate um, the development of flexible electronics um, and allow industry to realize a lot of these uh, fantastic applications um, and innovative new devices that I've talked about today. Thanks very much for your attention. All right, thank you.
Um, we will now open it up to q and I believe Kelly has a microphone. If the people in the audience could just speak into it so the WebEx folks could hear. Please show the slide, uh, organic and inorganic mobility at the very beginning of your, your presentation. Sure. Yes. Uh, what is the difference mobility on the unit centimeter square V minus one, S minus one, and to the right, centimeter square, S minus one, V minus one. What's the difference? There's no difference. <laughs> no difference. Which one is right? <laughs> They're both right. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? We have a couple WebEx questions. Um, Julie asked, how will, um, she was talking about, this was from the slide where you were showing the milk cartons yes. being printed. She was asking, how will this impact recyclability of product packages? It's a very good question. Um, in, in general, I think sustainability is, is, is definitely an emerging topic in organic electronics. Um, and uh, particularly, well, certainly if we used inorganic electronics for that, it would drastically affect recyclability because you're, you're adding, in some cases, toxic heavy metals, um, et cetera. There is an emerging effort to make biodegradable semiconductors. Interesting fact, um, a lot of, I'm, I, I mentioned that free radicals are where the, uh, the semiconducting properties of organic comes from. Um, it turns out that a lot of ma biologically derived materials that interact with free radicals are themselves semiconductors. And so, for example, there's a group out there that makes devices, switchable devices, using beta carotene as the semiconductor. And so there are, there are biologically derived and um, uh, synthetically made uh, approaches to, to getting uh, degradable organic semiconductors, but it's not something you're gonna get within organic semiconductors. Very good question. Great. Um, no one in the room right now? Okay, uh, the next one is, can flexible electronics printing be combined with 3D printing? Well, uh, we might have got that before I showed the maybe yeah <laughs> before I showed the 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 voxel eight slide. Um, I think there are definitely ways. Um, there certainly seems to be a desire for it in the maker community. Um, I, I I think that the a lot of the makers would like to have even an even more powerful uh, printable electronics capability than voxel eight has been able to make, which is at this point simple conducting lines. Um, imagine if uh, makers could also print solar cells and displays on their products. Um, and, and I think it, it's one of those things where there's no fundamental barriers, but there are a lot of tough engineering barriers to getting there. But I, I think, yes, we will eventually see um, 3D printing with those capabilities. Great. Um, is there any research covering the use of liquid suspended conducives? Conduct, maybe, so, um, Maybe the questioner is referring to conducting inks. Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, the most, most conducting inks are suspensions, or if you like, dispersions, um, stabilized particles in liquid. Uh, in, in the case of the silver particles or something like the clear on material, they're metallic particles. Um, in the case of graphene, carbon nanotubes, it's these inorganic particles. Um, the research themes uh, around these kinds of inks mostly relates to um, how the contacts between particles are formed. In fact, there has been an enormous amount of industry investment, most of which I'm sorry to say has failed, in trying to make carbon nanotube inks that work. Um, and the reason that they fail is because it's really, really hard to get good contact between the carbon nanotubes. The carbon nanotubes themselves are perfectly formed, charge transport highways, but you can't transport charge along just one tube. You have to do it through a tube mat that dries down. And it turns out that the tube to tube resistance is what kills you every time. Um, and there are probably related issues in graphene um, and in metallic nanowires. And again, the issue usually comes down to 
uh, particle to particle contact and the dried residue and how that affects conductivity. Okay, great. Anyone else in the room? All right, I have one final WebEx question. Um, someone asks, you mentioned elastomeric substrates. Yes. Does stretching a printed layer of organic semiconductor improve the alignment of molecules? <laughs> uh, somebody who knows something about it. Um, the answer is sometimes. So um, let me find that slide. Uh, when we were doing this work, um, what, we've, what we discovered is that um, you can actually get strain-induced orientation if the material, the organic semiconductor is sufficiently ductile. Um, and that means material that is actually low crystallinity, not high crystallinity. Uh, when you get strain-induced orientation, um, it tends to improve the semiconducting properties, the mobility, in one direction. Um, and it disimproves them in another. And so what you get is a, a film that has an anisotropic semiconducting quality, uh, which has some interesting potential device applications. Um, but this idea of an anisotropy in the transport properties is something that's intrinsic um, and all over the place in organic semiconductor research. And um, by orienting, by stress orienting or by um, I'm sorry, strain orienting, or by casting materials directionally and creating oriented uh, films, um, it provides a very powerful way of looking at that charge tra transport anisotropy in organics. Great, and I actually have one more question from WebEx. Sure. Um, are there incubators around the country looking at this technology? Is it regional? Um, yes. There, there are a wide variety of, of small, small companies. I don't know about incubators per se, but there's certainly a lot of startup activity. Um, Polyera, the company that made um, the Wolf watch, um, it is an example of a very long-lived startup. Um, it was started in 2005, and a decade later it has a product. Um, this uh, long sort of latency between starting the startup and actually having a product is what we're trying to address with a lot of the measurement techniques that we're trying to bring to bear here. Um, what, what, what we're dealing with is a fundamental new materials ecosystem and it takes an enormous amount of time to mature those materials and the knowledge of those materials and bring them into the commercial sphere as a, as a finished product. Okay, great. Anyone else? Final call? All right. Thank you so much. This was a Thanks great everyone. presentation, and we appreciate you coming. Thanks, everyone.